Welcome back 2021ers. This lecture will continue our discussion of memory systems and more or less round out our discussion of the main memory system, which comprises cache and DRAM. After that, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the extended memory system, in particular how disk drives and to some extent the virtual memory system factor into that. And later on in the semester, we'll round back around uh, to the virtual memory system as well. Just a few brief logistics announcements. Again, be having a look at Brian Halloran, Chapter 6, which covers this material in some depth and complements what we'll talk about here. Our goals today are to resolve a lot of the timing issues that we observed in cache uh, in, by examining a specific example of how caches tend to work in reality. And this will explain much of what you'll observe, not in homework nine, which involved just architectural timing loops, uh, but in homework 10, where you'll begin to look at timing programs that deal with visiting memory in different uh, sort of patterns, uh, similar to what we have seen in the lecture so far. Uh, so we'll be having a look to finish up homework nine over the course of tomorrow and look for homework 10 to come out relatively soon. It will reflect very closely one of the problems that you'll have on project four soon, which is to figure out how to adapt an algorithm to visit the pattern that uh, visit memory to favor cache to give you a more favorable pattern uh, and improve execution speeds. One final brief announcement, exam two and project three grades have been posted. Uh, regrade requests can be made through Gradescope uh, through early next week. So Sunday, I believe, for the exam and Monday for the project. We left off last time discussing briefly some of the circuitry involved in these parts of memory. That the SRAM that comprises cache is comprised of these flip-flops and involves a lot more transistors than the equivalent storage of a single bit in DRAM, which is comprised of a single transistor along with a capacitor. These two approaches have different advantages and disadvantages and generally complement each other. Uh, it should begin, uh, again be reiterated that the additional space and number of transistors required for SRAM uh, it increases its cost considerably, and this is in part due to the amount of real estate on a chip that they would occupy. But the great advantage is one of speed in that uh, they can produce results much faster. On the other hand, the DRAM uh, the bit storage, which has to do with this combination of a capacitor and a transistor, allows uh, with this small footprint a lot of bits to be stored in a small square surface area. And this leads to much cheaper storage for it. Uh, up here, we examined briefly a table for this. And thank you to the wise observer who actually read their textbook and saw that the number that I had up here for the 2015 cost per megabyte of SRAM was a typo. That, in fact, it has been degrading over time, uh, getting lower. Uh, and in fact, the price compared to what it was in 1985 for SRAM per megabyte has dropped by more than 100-fold. This is a pittance, though, compared to the tens of thousand fold uh, decrease in the cost of DRAM. The speed difference, however, has dropped 100 fold in SRAM, but only about 10 fold from 200 nanosecond delay uh, to get something out of DRAM to a 20 second uh, delay out of DRAM. Uh, this is uh, an order of magnitude slower than the equivalent SRAM. And so the way that these two typically play out in real systems is that you have some big SRAM caches uh, on the chip itself, the CPU. But off that CPU chip, across the memory system bus, uh, you'll actually see much larger quantities of memory available through the DRAM that's present in uh, main memory. And generally, we'll see that copies of stuff that's in DRAM are brought onto the CPU and put into cache in the different layers uh, to make them available to the CPU uh, more quickly. Uh, the logic being that as you make a request from main memory, it'll make sense to bring a hunk of main memory into cache and try to exploit properties that most programs exhibit. Those are properties of temporal and spatial locality. We'll see some specifics about that in just mere moments here. So then, in order to understand this CPU and memory system interaction, it's best to think of it as a client and server sort of model where the CPU is the client making requests that the memory system services and does so as fast as possible. Generally, the CPU would issue some instruction like, I need what's at memory address FFF1234. And I want that to be loaded into one of my special memory locations uh, like the register RAX. 
the memory system will go through the parts of the CPU that have data stored in it. And if the data that's associated with memory address FFF1234 is present uh, there, uh, then this is referred to as a cache hit. Now it should be uh, mentioned that this memory address is gonna be used to look things up and they may actually be copies of what's at this memory address in several spots. In most cases, there will be a main memory address that's uh, associated with this uh, that you can always go back to. But as the system populates uh, its memory uh, caches uh, with copies of this stuff, you may find it sooner and not have to go as far out. Uh, to make this sort of uh, concrete, back here, as the register file would want what's in that memory address, uh, the CPU would serve to look through its memories uh, first in the L1 cache, and if it's found there, then it's a very short trip uh, into the register file. On the other hand, if that's a miss, as in uh, what I'm looking for is a copy of what's at memory address FFF1234, it's not in here, then the next place to look is a little farther out in the L2 cache. If it's found there, then a copy or a hunk of it is brought into the L1 cache, uh, and then the specific piece that's required is uh, plopped down in the register. If not found in the L2 cache, of course, you search for the L3 cache. And finally, if it's not on the CPU chip at all, then it will go across this I.O. bridge uh, to search main memory for it. And so you'll see uh, there's a progressively farther out set of areas uh, that this memory system is going to search to see if it can find what's at this address. Uh, keeping in mind then that these are copies uh, that are in the caches. Uh, one could eventually e end up in the main memory system looking for that uh, piece, which is then brought in and populated across the L3, the L2, the L1 cache, and finally into the register. It is possible, it turns out, that what we're looking for, this memory address FFF7890 uh, or FFF1234, it isn't actually in main memory at all. Uh, this is a bit of a sort of quizzical um, proposition of how it could it be that if I'm asking for something at a mem main memory address that it couldn't actually be in main memory. We won't be in a good position to resolve that until we discuss the virtual memory system and find out that as a CPU program or as a sort of user program makes a request to the CPU uh, work with this following address, uh, this is actually a virtual address that the hardware is going to translate to a physical address. And the operating system, which is working behind the scenes on this, may have rearranged things just a little bit so uh, what you're looking for isn't actually in main memory at the moment. Uh, so, but pin, pin, uh, put a pin in that. Uh, we'll discuss it in some more detail later on in the context of that virtual memory system. For the moment, just pretend that we have a sequence of spots to look for uh, this uh, memory address, that there could be cache copies of it in the, one of the fast caches, or have to move out to the farther, uh, slower caches, or go all the way off the CPU to main memory and access it via DRAM. There are a couple kinds of misses, then, that bear explicit mention here. As a program starts running, it doesn't have any data that populates the caches at all. This cache, as it's uh, mentioned up here, is part of the CPU itself, and CPUs are always shared uh, through the operating system by all of the programs that are running on the system. So, for instance, if you are running even your home computer, chances are very likely, as you're listening to this, you have a browser window open to YouTube, uh, but you might also have uh, some other browser tabs open. Uh, you might have some other uh, utilities, like a text editor open. All of those are taking turns on the CPU that you have and must share the cache that is present in here. Uh, as a program moves in, it will start loading various things. All of these are gonna be misses because it's taking over the CPU after another program had its way with the CPU. Uh, that means they'll be, the caches are uh, thought of as cold, as in they haven't been warmed up uh, by a series of instructions to load data into them. Uh, as your program gets a chance to actually run, uh, then it will bring things in from main memory, populating these caches. Uh, and if it has good properties of temporal and spatial locality, then it's likely that it'll start hitting cache more and more. But the initial phase in most programs uh, is, involves a lot of cache misses as they're just getting underway. So this is uh, referred to then as a compulsory or a cold miss. Uh, program doesn't have a chance uh, to uh, sort of get any hits because it hasn't put anything in cache yet. Uh, we'll see that played out according to some hardware in the specific example we looked at in a minute. The next kind that works uh, or sort of uh, is worth mentioning uh, is a capacity miss. 
uh, that it is possible that despite having reasonably good spatial and temporal locality in your program, the amount of data that it's working with and cycling through is just too big to fit in cache. So say you have a 30 megabyte array that you are attempting to uh, repeatedly analyze for patterns. So you scan across it once and then scan across it again and then scan across it a third time. Uh, turns out that the caches that are present uh, here are measured in only at most the like a, a handful of megabytes, like four to eight megabytes uh, for the combined totals of L1, L2 and L3 cache on most CPUs. 30 megabytes doesn't fit in here. And so despite sort of iterating over the same array multiple times, uh, your program uh, is going to suffer this capacity set of misses where it brings in parts of the array into cache and then moves on to later parts of the array that aren't in cache, so overwrites all of cache with these later parts of the array. All that fits in main memory, but you can't get the entire array in cache, and so the repeated sort of visits to parts of that array uh, will miss on account of it not fitting in cache. Uh, cache is generally a precious resource, it's much smaller than main memory, uh, and numbering in uh, just a small handful of megabytes uh, means that some problems uh, will have a big data that's too big to fit in there. The CPU, uh, at least in the modern sense, does a lot of work to try to prefetch things. Uh, so it'll anticipate uh, if you're using memory addresses in this pattern, we'll attempt to bring things into cache ahead of time on that front. Uh, but there's only so far you can go in that front, and big enough data is always going to exhaust cache. But it turns out that a lot of programs have what's known as a working set, uh, as in maybe you're working with a big piece of data overall, but at a given phase in a program, uh, you're only working with a small portion of that data. Uh, a typical example is you're editing some very large program file. Maybe the program file is thousands of lines long, uh, but you tend to be editing only a few lines at a time and rarely are making some bulk changes that change everything in the file. Uh, to that end, the lines that you are editing will end up in cache uh, and make the editing of those lines very efficient on that front. Finally then, the last kind that is worth mentioning, uh, mentioning is a conflict miss. What we'll find is that since the amount of data that you want to place from main memory in cache is too big to fit in there, then there has to be some placement policy associated with this part of main memory is always going to go to this part of cache to enable the check on is memory address uh, FFF1234 in cache in a moment. Uh, there has to be a very well-defined mapping of this part of main memory to this part of cache. That means that some parts of main memory, so it's so much bigger, since it's so much bigger than cache, are going to map to the same placement. And if your program's unlucky, two pieces of memory that it might be working with will map to the same spot in cache, creating a conflict. That is, you work with one piece, it gets brought from main memory into a spot, but the next piece you work with wants to be in the same spot. So you have to evict the first piece uh, and move the second place in, only to later on need that first piece again. Uh, it's been kicked out of cache, and so you have to go back to main memory and bring it in. Uh, this makes more sense once you actually understand some of the details of what these cache placement policies look like and how certain things that you load will overwrite other things that are already present in cache. So we'll revisit this placement policy business in just a minute as we look at a specific example. In order to understand how these placement policies and how cache in general works out, you'll have to understand at the hardware level some of the pieces uh, that are used in order to establish this mapping of this part of main memory goes to this part of cache. The terminology associated with this is a little bit wonky, uh, but you think of a memory address that is uh, numbered from bit 0 to 31, or in the case of 64 bits, uh, 0 to 63 over here. Uh, and most cache systems divide a memory address uh, into three hunks. The reason that we're talking about memory addresses at all is that earlier on we saw that this is going to uh, sort of stem from the CPU issuing a request for a particular memory address that it wants to be loaded, for instance, into a register. This memory address then comprised of those 32 or 64 bits. Uh, it's going to be disassembled and parts of that address itself are going to be looked at to determine where to look in cache first. Uh, to that end, since the memory address is known, but the value associated with what's in that memory address box isn't, uh, then the memory address itself serves as the lookup key as you search cache for things. Generally then, we'll divide that into three hunks referred to as the low bits, uh, the offsets, 
uh, the middle bits here, uh, the cache sets, and the upper bits referred to as a tag. The cache set are going to serve as sort of an index, uh, giving us a spot to look in cache for stuff. The tag as an identifier uh, to indicate if I look in this spot in the cache and see this tag, then I know the memory address I was looking for uh, is actually present. And the offset then uh, will uh, dictate how big the cache lines are and allow me to pick out uh, various parts of the memory address over there. Uh, to make that concrete, suppose you had a tiny 8-bit address that's comprised of just one byte, uh, and if you recall your hexadecimal discussion, a single byte is represented using two hexadecimal digits, each of these accounting for four bits of information. So breaking out this uh, OX28 into its constituent bits, the 8 is a 1000, uh, and that would be the offset associated with this. Uh, if we're breaking off this thing into 4-bit chunks for the offset, that leaves 4 bits here for the tag and the cache set. We'll take 2 bits for the tag uh, and 2 bits on the upper side, uh, sorry, 2 bits for the cache set and 2 bits for the tag up top. Uh, it turns out then that if you look at this uh, and compare it to a memory address like OX20, the upper bits here, uh, the 0 and the 2, are the same. It's just the offset that is different. Uh, and so it'll turn out that these two addresses map to the same location and have the same tag. Uh, and this will be on account of their adjacent in memory. And this will give rise to this notion of hunks of main memory being brought into cache all at once. So some additional uh, information over here that summarizes uh, what I've talked about. Uh, but generally, then, we'll want to look at these three parts in the specific example uh, to see how this thing works. The exercise that I have for you that underscores this uh, will take the following tack. Uh, first, let's examine what's in the cache at a moment. And you'll see over here on the right-hand side is this very small cache. It essentially is like an array that has four slots in it. Uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3, if you're counting for the binary over here. On the left-hand side is main memory, which is considerably bigger. In the example that we're looking at here, we have just 8-bit addresses here. Uh, and so the single hexadecimal uh, business over here, uh, that is uh, the memory address, uh, it shows up on the left-hand side. To make it easier to interpret, over here are the bit-level representations of that address, broken into the three hunks that we're going to talk about a 4-bit uh, offset, a 2-bit set, that's the middle bits, and a 2-bit tag, uh, those are the high bits over there. Uh, you can see that I have grouped this sort of memory set of addresses uh, going by single bytes. And so you think of this as, okay, here's a number that's at byte address 0, a number that's at byte address uh, 0, 8. Uh, these distances between those memory address uh, addresses indicate that the value that's stored here is an 8-byte number. Now, as in this 331, it's encoded in 8 bytes of memory, probably having a whole lot of zeros sort of leading on that front, because the adjacent number, it's uh, 8 bytes away on that front. You can see over here uh, in cache set 01, those two values are copied, 333 and 334. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the cache set 01 right here that matches uh, the values here at 0, 1 for 333 3, 3, and 0, 1 for 334. 3, 3, and also, uh, the tag that's stored here of 0, 0, that matches the tag in main memory uh, for these two. Uh, 0, 0 here and a 0, 0 here. Uh, this is on account of the position for 333 and 334 here. They're dictated by this uh, central set of bits uh, that indicate the set. Uh, if you think of this as an array, this hunk of memory at 10 and 18, they are always going to map to this location, cache set 01. If you scan ahead a little ways, you'll see some other buggers here, for instance, D0, uh, that share that same set. And it'll be uh, the case that you cannot have both uh, this 10 and 18 and this D0 and D8 both be resident at this cache line of 01 at the same time. Instead, they conflict with each other due to the placement policy uh, that anything that has a set of 01 is going to go into this slot. You also notice uh, that there are two numbers in here, 333 and 334. They occupy this cache line or cache block, as it were. Uh, these are adjacent in memory. Uh, you can see over in main memory, 333 and 334. Uh, and it's also a byproduct of the fact that there are four bits used for offset here. Uh, you can see then that at offset 0 uh, in here, bytes 0 to 7, that's where 333 is at. That offset 8, uh, that's 100 here for offset. 
That's where uh, 334 starts. And that corresponds to the offsets that you see over here, the low bits associated with their addresses. So all the information about where to find 334, if it's in cache, is present in its address. As in, I would go to slot 01, uh, and here it is. I would check, does the tag uh, that's at slot 01 match the tag in my address, 00? Yes, it does. And if I wanted 334 uh, that's at this address, 18, then I'd pick off the offset bytes, uh, bits here uh, to calculate an offset of 8 from them and go 8 bytes into this cache line, and there is the 334 that I'm interested in. One other column that shows up in this cache uh, sort of uh, infrastructure is this valid bit, uh, marked as V here. And you can see that some of these are marked as valid, while others are not. The zero here means cache line 00 is invalid right now. It is very likely that there is a tag and some data in here in terms of the blocks or line, uh, but that is left over from some other program that was running prior to this program getting access to it. Prior to this program having a chance to load anything uh, to set zero, um, those everything in here is marked as invalid. And so this program must have been running for some time and had a chance to load things into its tiny cache at lines or at sets 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, but it hasn't issued an instruction that would access anything that has a set of 0, 0 yet. So it hasn't accessed, for instance, memory addresses 0, 0 or 0, 8, and hasn't accessed, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, down here, C0 or C8 either. Uh, if it had accessed either of those, then you'd see one of the two of them, uh, either the 331, 332, or the 551 and 552 uh, present in here, and the valid bit would be changed to, to one in that case. So uh, to that end, your exercise is to issue these three instructions uh, from the CPU to see if this uh, results in a either cache hit or a cache miss. Uh, if it's a cache hit, indicate where this address was found. However, if it's a cache miss, uh, then show how this table up here in cache would change. Keep in mind that you want to take this address and break it into its constituent bits. In an actual CPU uh, instruction, the hardware would be able to disassemble this FFF, which is a series of four ones, and the zero over here, which is zero, 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 uh, sorry, four zeros rather, uh, and be able to fish out the tag and set and so forth. To make that easier, it's probably a good idea just to take this address, find its equivalent entry over here, and look at the bits associated with that. Knowing that in an actual CPU, you wouldn't have to visit main memory in any way in order to determine is this in cache or not. So examine these three instructions to load these three, determine if it's a miss or a hit, and if it's a miss, what changes up here? Because anything that's a miss is going to move from main memory and a copy of it will be placed in cache over here. Take a second, work through that, and if you're in a hurry, just wait a moment and we'll work through this example together in the next moment. All right, spoilers in three, two, one. Here we go. I'm going to pull up a text version of this so we can actually make changes to it. Uh, the first instruction here is to load OX08. Uh, it doesn't matter what register we're loading it into. This is going to be a request to the main memory system to say, find me this thing, find it as fast as possible. To make my life easier, I just come up here to this memory address 08 uh, to sort of emphasize the fact that I don't need to go main memory. Uh, this is equal to the address uh, 000010. And importantly, I'll first start by looking at the middle bits here, uh, which indicate that the set I should be looking at in cache is 00. Coming up here to this table, you see that at 00, uh, there is nothing in here because that cache line has been marked as invalid. That means this is definitely a miss, and it's one of those compulsory or cold misses, as in the program hasn't had time to load anything into this cache yet, uh, but this is the first chance, and hopefully we'll be hitting this cache line a bunch of times uh, subsequently. So then, this means what's in cache is not good, uh, but we're going to make it good soon. Uh, I'm going to flip this bit uh, to a 1 to indicate it's going to be valid in just a second. I have to go to main memory address, uh, OX08, to fetch what is there. Importantly, at OX08 over here, I'm going to take everything that's around this OX08 that matches its set, these middle bits, and its tag. And you'll notice that despite this being a higher address, the thing that matches the set and the tag are actually at a lower address. 
uh, that's at zero, zero. Uh, and so I will take both of these pieces of data, 331 and 332, and load them into the cache line at offset zero for 331 and at offset eight for, uh, the, sorry, at offset uh, zero for the address zero and offset eight for address eight. So that means over here in the cache line, I'm gonna plop in a 331 and a 332 over here. Uh, adjust my table back. Uh, and then finally, I need to mark the uh, cache line here as containing the things that have cache uh, line, uh, sorry, sorry, things that have the tag associated with this cache line. That's uh, tag zero, zero over here. So I'm gonna plop that down here as zero, zero. And this is important because this enables me now, it took me some 100 nanoseconds to copy this stuff from main memory into the cache. But if I ask for either of these things again, it'll be a hit in cache again. So I'm gonna mark this thing as uh, a miss. Uh, and let's see, I wanna turn off my automatic line wrapping there. Uh, and changes uh, set zero, zero. And I'll just mark this up here with a little star to indicate that's changed uh, during the course of the example. The next instruction is to load OXF0. Uh, to make my life easier, I'm just gonna copy this address over here uh, and proceed with analysis of it here. Uh, according to the breakdown, uh, let's see, I guess I missed a zero over here. Uh, the set that I should be looking at is one, one. Uh, so I'll plot, uh, look up here and see that, yeah, there is something that's valid in one, one. The next step is to determine, is it what I'm looking for? As in, does the tag that's uh, the upper bits of this address match what is in the tag that's stored associated with that data? And in this case, it does not. Uh, what's here is a tag of zero, zero, which means I have what amounts to a conflict miss now, uh, in that something is here, but it's not the thing that I'm looking for. I'm about to get rid of this data and replace it with some other data. So again, this will be a miss. Uh, and I will need to go out to main memory, uh, fetch that address OXF0 and its adjacent uh, uh, address, and modify what's in set 1-1 here. So over here, uh, looking at F0, I see that it has a set of 1-1 one, one, uh, and a tag of 1-1 one, one, as we determined earlier. And the thing that matches that is the piece of memory that's after it in this case. Uh, so F8, that means I'll move the 557 that you see here uh, to overwrite the 337. Uh, and the 558 uh, that's present over there uh, in F8, that's gonna be moving into offset eight in the cache line here. Uh, finally then, I'll change the tag to say there's new data in here uh, in case I am looking for it later on. Unfortunately, if later on I had a load that was going to load up the thing I just evicted at one one, uh, sorry, uh, 0011 up here, this 3038, this will again be a conflict in that I've overwritten the data that I had there with something else. A way around this we'll see is to have a somewhat more complex associative cache, uh, but put a pin in that for a moment until we complete the exercise. Finally then, uh, the last load instruction down here uh, asks about OX18. Uh, to make my life easier, I'm gonna take the bits over here and copy them uh, just to analyze them uh, for convenience. The middle bits here are a zero one. So that means I should be looking in set zero one. Uh, that's uh, this line up here. I uh, wanna look uh, to see that yes, it's valid in here. So this program has loaded something into this cache line. And I wanna have a look at the tag to see that yes, actually I have a match in this case, that the tag of what's stored in that set matches what I'm interested in. This then is a hit, and it's our first hit uh, to observe. Uh, so as I'm looking for this uh, OX18, the last few bits here, which were a 1000, they indicate an offset eight. Uh, so up here, uh, that being found uh, at set one uh, and uh, let's see, uh, at offset eight, uh, then what I'm looking for is this 334 value that within this uh, cache line, it's at offset of byte eight. Uh, that's the 334 that I'm looking for. And you can see that that matches what's over here in main memory. But because I was able to analyze this uh, and find it, uh, found in set uh, zero one, uh, I don't ever have to incur the cost of going out to main memory, some 100 nanoseconds, that instead uh, I'll be able to get this thing into the register that I'm trying to load it in, uh, inside of a few nanoseconds, uh, three to five nanoseconds. 
to that end, then we've saved quite a bit of time uh, uh, by virtue of that. So then, this should give you an idea of the basic mechanics in a very simplified setting for caches. It's worth mentioning a couple extensions here. First, this is a tiny main memory that uses only 8-bit uh, addresses, although back in the day, uh, the sort of birthing era of computing, uh, we had 8-bit addresses. Uh, that's no longer the case. In fact, folks move very quickly to 16-bit addresses uh, to circumvent uh, the memory limitations associated with. And of course, you know now we have 32 and 64-bit addresses, so this is considerably larger in terms of the address uh, sizes and amount of memory that you could address there. Uh, there'll be more bits then subdivided between uh, the tag, the set, and the offset. Uh, but generally then, the size of the offset bits here, they determine how big these cache blocks or cache lines are. And you can see, because I chose uh, four bits here, that means these are grouped into chunks of 16 bytes, uh, as in there are two 8-byte numbers, 331 and 332, that occupy a cache line over here. If instead of longs here that are 8 bytes, I chose uh, plain integers, which are only 4 bytes, then I could fat, uh, fit up to 4 integers in this. And if instead I was looking at characters as byte level addresses, then I could fit 16 characters in here at bytes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the cache itself is independent of the kind of data, it just stores things at a byte level. Uh, but to keep individual values uh, sort of uh, within individual cache lines, the compiler oftentimes generates instructions that try to line things up at even addresses, uh, like uh, word uh, addressable uh, boundaries like uh, that are divisible by 16. We've seen this kind of phenomenon earlier when we were looking at the architectural features of calling functions, where the uh, address associated with uh, the stack pointer had to be evenly divisible by 16 as you made function calls in order to be compatible with Intel chips. Uh, but that's uh, a, a slight uh, sort of relation to this kind of thing where uh, the compiler and the runtime system try to lay things out at byte boundaries so that they line up well with cache lines. Uh, so the other thing uh, that is worth mentioning, and we'll see this uh, later on uh, shortly, is that then uh, the byte uh, amount stored in cache lines tends to be a bit bigger uh, than 16 bytes, uh, although not often uh, hugely bigger. Uh, and the number of sets available tends to be larger than what we have here. Uh, only four sets here, uh, and we'll see that in modern caches that are somewhat more complex than, than this, you actually fit more than one tag uh, per, per box. But this is representative of the style of things and is perhaps even representative of some simple real-world hardware either in the past or in the present. Uh, the total cache size then uh, that we see here is only a paltry 64 bytes, and we'll see in actual CPU caches uh, it's much larger than that typically to facilitate fast operation of programs to keep the processor fed. With that example in hand, uh, there are sort of plain answers here, but you can see that this is a dynamic process and that you really only understand it by going through it step by step. Uh, so make sure to practice on this uh, just by rewinding and reworking the examples or potentially trying your own sets of loads down here using the addresses that show up in the table. To build on our discussion here then, uh, what we've talked about so far is a direct mapped cache. Uh, that over here you have each cache line uh, sort of mapping to exactly one set. You think of this thing as an array and all that you can store in that array is a single cache line. That's a set of bytes here that have some address that corresponds to the set uh, that the cache is, is looking to, to use. Uh, we've seen then that this can cause conflict misses, uh, or better off, the phenomenon known as thrashing, where you're constantly trying to load something that wants to be uh, at the same location in cache. Uh, we saw earlier on that uh, this 337 that wanted to be a cache line uh, 11, uh, it was overwritten after we loaded, uh, I think it's the F0 uh, down here, F0, which also wants to be at 1.1 but has a different tag. This is a different set of data. So on loading that, uh, we got different data in here. 
if the next set of loads were to load what's at uh, cat, or, uh, memory location 38, then I'd have to overwrite this line uh, with the 337 and the 338 again. And if I'm cycling in between those, the F0 and the 38 and so forth, then this will thrash and spend a lot of time not doing useful work, but just overwriting this position in cache with different things. These are trips out to main memory then that could be avoided if the cache were just a little bit smarter, had space to store both of those things. But by virtue of our placement algorithm, which is very simple, uh, we're getting hit with this uh, unnecessary burden. To avoid this, most modern caches have some amount of associativity uh, to them. Uh, so an associative cache is one that per set here, uh, there are at least a couple slots to store things that share the same set. This would allow, for instance, both 337, uh, 338, and the alternative down here, 557, 558, that have a different tag, uh, for them both to exist down here at set 11 because there are actually two positions. You can imagine that the hardware to do this is somewhat more complex, uh, driving up the cost associated with it. Uh, the hardware engineers, though, are usually crafty on this front, and there's a great benefit to this because it reduces the amount of thrashing that you get uh, by being unlucky and accessing two pieces of data that happen to want to be at the same uh, cache set. Uh, this also requires, though, in hardware there to be some eviction policy. Because as you see, I can fit two things in here, and those happen to be, in this diagram, the only two things uh, that have uh, set 1-1. One, one. You can imagine that somewhere in between here, the 3-8 and the C-0, there's a bunch of other memory elements, and at least one of them is also going to have a cache set of 1-1. One, one. Uh, so I could not store three things in here. Uh, instead, the hardware would have to uh, implement some sort of an eviction policy to say, well, now I'm loading yet another thing with a different tag of uh, zero 01, for instance, in here, and which one of these buggers do I kick out? It tends to be the case that most modern cache algorithms use something simple. Uh, they'll say whatever the least recently used element in here, be it 337 or 557, uh, though that one I'm going to get rid of uh, to emphasize the temporal locality, that if I haven't used it in a while, it's more likely uh, to not be used again in the future. So in that case, in addition to the information you see stored here, uh, it's very likely that the hardware would have some counter to indicate uh, this is the ranking of most recently used, least recently used, and if I'm loading something in here, uh, then this gets evicted and the new item becomes the most recently used, decrementing uh, the rest of the contents in there. This all complicates the hardware somewhat, but you can more or less expected in modern caches, at least on reasonably high-end CPUs. If you want some information about your own cache, uh, then at least on Linux, there are a couple of very easy ways to acquire it. There's a handy program that we already explored in a lab, albeit briefly, called LSCPU. Running this on most Linux distributions, and I believe it's pre-installed in most cases, uh, will list out some high-level information about the CPU and its properties. For instance, on my laptop, I can do this. Uh, some of the output is over here, but I think it's worthwhile just to do this in a shell. Uh, do an LS CPU, uh, and you'll see a whole uh, girth of information, uh, wealth that is, uh, including things like this is an x86-64 architecture. It can operate in either 32 or 64 bit mode. Uh, that's something that uh, is worth mentioning that the uh, AMD folks who initially put this 64 bit system together, this x86-64 uh, system, uh, the reason it was so much more successful uh, than uh, some of its contemporaries was that it was backwards compatible and could run in 32 bit modes. Uh, that eased the transition uh, to the 64 bit era and economically beat out a lot of the competitors. Uh, so being backwards compatible paid a lot of dividends there. Other things to mention is that since it's in the Intel family of chips, it's a little Indian. Uh, there are addresses that are encoded using 36 physical and 48 bits uh, in the virtual memory system. We'll talk more about what that means later on in our discussion of uh, the virtual memory system. My particular laptop right now has four CPUs, although this is a little bit of a, uh, a lie, uh, that instead the CPUs that are listed zero to three, uh, there's actually only two cores uh, and a uh, single socket, so two physical CPUs. 
Uh, it's just that the Intel chips implement this weird system called hyper-threading that allows them to fake it to the operating system, pretend that a single core is actually two cores. We don't have time to get into that, and it's a bit of uh, marketing jargon, although there are some, uh, some hardware benefits uh, to it. Uh, if you're actually trying to do serious numerical computation, uh, the hyper-threading doesn't help you too much, so long as you're able to keep the CPU fed with data through good memory programming. A bunch of other uh, information since uh, the Intel uh, make and model and so forth along with the CPU maxes, but the thing I want to focus on is down here, on uh, that there's some high-level information about my cache. Uh, we looked at a 64-byte cache uh, that was present in that tiny example. And in truth, this uh, system has, uh, on each core, a 64-kilobyte cache. Uh, so uh, an order of magnitude much uh, larger than that example we looked at. It's uh, divided into a data cache and an instruction cache, this uh, D cache and I cache, as they're called. There's a unified cache for the L2 level and an L3 cache uh, that's actually shared. Uh, we'll, 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 uh, so it follows very much uh, the picture that we saw earlier, except that on my particular CPU, I only have two cores rather than the four that are, are uh, present here. To that end, if you want even more detailed information, oh, I, before I leak, uh, get to that, uh, just mention uh, down here are a bunch of sort of uh, intimidating looking vulnerabilities uh, that we mentioned earlier on that most modern CPUs that are manufactured by AMD uh, and Intel suffer from some common hardware bugs that are discovered. Uh, there are some mitigation uh, parts to this uh, that are present in the Linux kernel. They hurt performance a little bit, uh, but generally aren't too bad on that front. Uh, and then there are a bunch of flags indicating the capabilities of the CPU, such as it has a floating point unit, uh, which are good. Uh, now, what I was getting at is if you want some more detailed information about uh, the caches themselves and their properties, then you can actually explore an interesting subsection of the Linux uh, directory structure under sys. And this relates not so much to files that are stored, uh, but are usually handles that the operating system provides in the form of file uh, names that give information about the hardware. Uh, buried under there uh, is a sys devices system CPU, uh, and then they'll see uh, CPU 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for each of the CPUs that your particular system has. Uh, in my case, I have, think I have uh, CPU 0 to 4 based on this sort of four reported CPUs over here. Uh, allow me to demonstrate. So this will be uh, changing to uh, sys, uh, and then I'm forgetting already, um, devices, uh, system, CPU, uh, and if I list in here, you see CPU 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, along with a few other things. I'm just going to change into CPU 0. Uh, and in here, the very first directory that's listed is the cache, uh, along with a bunch of other things that you might be interested in looking at. But our primary interest is in cache, so let's change into that directory. <laughs> Uh, listing this, you'll see an index 0, index 1, index 2, and index 3. These are the four caches that uh, the CPU has, uh, although as I would look in index 0, for instance, uh, it's a directory, uh, and you'll see a bunch of sort of things in there. Uh, if I just, uh, it's a cat out index 0, all the things that are in there, you'll see a bunch of information. Uh, each of these correspond to uh, the sort of, uh, different properties associated with it. Uh, for instance, I think the, let's see, coherency line size 64, uh, that, that's that first field here. Uh, the ID is zero. The level is one, so this is an L1 cache. The number of sets that it has is actually 64. So this is considerably larger uh, than uh, the four-way uh, uh, sort of set that we had in our earlier example. So that instead of uh, this tiny little table over here is an array that's 64 big. Uh, and that considerable size then is also complemented uh, based on a uh, see, ways of associativity. That's the very last field down here. So each of those 64 boxes uh, that it has uh, has a um, eight possible uh, slots in it. So it's like this table over here where there are 64 of these uh, and each of the sort of contents can hold up to eight different things. Uh, you can imagine then this is somewhat complex hardware to facilitate this, but it really reduces the amount of thrashing and conflict misses that you can expect to get there. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not uh, misspeaking here that, yeah, these sort of uh, levels uh, here is uh, uh, 
uh, time number, yeah, uh, numbers are 64. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's looking about right on, on, on my on my phone. Uh, and then finally in here, there's a size field, and you can see here it's 32 kilobytes there. Uh, the kind of this cache uh, is a data cache. And if I did the same thing over here in the index one, uh, you'd see that this is also a level one cache, uh, but it's the instruction cache instead. At this sort of innermost level, those two are treated separately, where chunks of data that are gonna be read and written are moved into the data cache, versus instructions that are gonna be given to the CPU to execute, uh, those are moved into the instruction cache to be fed uh, in the instruction stream to be decoded to be what's to actually be done in the CPU. As you move out uh, to that index two uh, cache, uh, then this one is now at level two. It is considerably bigger. It's unified, so both instructions and data are stored in there. And then finally, index three is the level three cache, which is yet again much bigger, uh, unified, and has uh, a wider uh, associativity level to it. So on that front, uh, you can garner a considerable amount of information about real CPUs, at least on Linux systems. It's very likely on a Mac or on a Windows, there's some similar facility that might be obtainable on the command line or obtainable by going through the right set of GUI menus. Uh, it's relatively easy to find on Linux stuff uh, just by visiting parts of the file system, uh, which is one of the beauties if you wanted to write some utility that's optimized uh, based on what the cache size is on the CPU, uh, it could just read these files and determine uh, what's going on in there and make decisions accordingly. That will be the end of our discussion for the moment. Make sure to spend some time practicing this kind of a table problem because it's very likely to occur on an exam. Uh, you know at this point that I favor at least some sort of uh, data analysis and table working kinds of problems. And in an examination on your understanding of the memory system, uh, this is almost a sure bet. We will pick up next time, uh, begin our discussion of the rest of the memory system, in particular persistent storage, uh, which is generally disk drives and the different forms of persistent or permanent storage that you can make. Uh, this ties into the uh, rest of the memory system in various ways that we'll continue to explore as we move on and discuss the virtual memory system. For now though, I hope you all are happy and healthy and able to get some hacking in. I'll see you in discussion on Wednesday and again in lecture on Friday.